political will, and it's also a question of, of moral will, in a sense. So, in, in some senses, we give lip service to the idea of human rights, yeah. I believe, and um, if we really were, were very serious about that, I think we would organise society a lot differently. I mean, we think very critically about the capitalist mode of production, you know, winners and losers and all that kind of stuff, but we certainly would, as a first priority, you know, if, if the value system that you seem to have was prevalent throughout the world, you would then think, well, how come it, how come it, it isn't it the case that everyone is fed? It just doesn't seem to make sense. Well, because, as I was saying at the point, people feel more connection to people closer to themselves, and that starving children in Africa, most people ignore it on a daily basis because it's a world away. And those same people, those same people who asked them would say that they would adhere to the principle of, of human rights. Of course. Okay. There so, is that disconnect yeah. there that people, you know, that human rights is a huge issue and that people often just don't care that much. Okay, so you're, you're essentially saying that you've got these concentric circles yes. and that almost, if you like, um, creates some kind of nationalism or creates some kind of, you know, uh, community feeling for people, you know, close the, to the closer, yeah. yeah. And then you've got your nation and then maybe some international relations. Yeah. And that's why you feel that other animals are even further away because well, substantially people, I people care, care about humans as well. I care far more about children in Africa than I do about other animals. But, and it's, you know, it's, it's almost bad to say, but I'm not doing anything about starving children in Africa. I, I'm sitting here having a professional with Roger, I'm, you know, going to go home, I'm going to sleep fine, as people die all over the world. And if I, if there was a moral issue that I wanted to present, then I'd fly to Africa and help well, them. Well, one of the first things you could do to help them is to be vegan. Uh, I don't see, don't really see how that would help. Um, you know, an, another issue, of course, is the fact that, uh, you know, pollution doesn't uh, respect national boundaries and uh, the environmental impact of meat eating is great. And so now we've got an issue that... Um, Do you differentiate between beef and chicken in terms of meat industry? I, differ I differentiate between um, beef and chicken in, in several ways, in the, in the sense that if you talk about the conversion rate in this argument, then the conversion rate from your argument is better in terms of chickens. Oh, it is. I, I accept yeah, that. I'd I mean, mainly yeah, eat chicken yeah. more, more so than beef. Yeah, I accept okay. that beef have, does have issues with it yeah. things. It's interesting. You see, the language is interesting. You, I say chickens. You say chicken. Oh, I yeah. eat chicken. I, yeah, I don't know. Right. The food is chicken yeah. rather than... Well, you eat chickens. So, you know, it's, it's, it's quite interesting because if you look at a ideology that separates, then it's linguistic in character. You know, so, you know, speech of this will often, I mean, you, you already described other animals as things. So, if you were just describing the behavior of a dog, you might be saying it, or a cow, it, right? Yeah. Rather than she or he. Well, if I couldn't identify the gender, if I could identify the gender, I probably would use he or she. Yeah, okay. So, you know, often part of the prejudice, but also the ideological social construct, is built into the language as well, which some people are trying to kind of. Uh, you know, you know, in the, in the same way as feminists try to challenge yeah. you know, patriarchal language, yeah. and um, you know, the famous case there would be kind of you know, history became his story and that kind of stuff. Yeah. So there are people, and John Denayer in particular, uh, an animal rights theorist, trying to challenge linguistically what we do to the animals, yeah. which is to lessen their moral status by calling them it, uh, and that you know, it pushes them away and creates that very social distance that you're claiming you rely on in order to eat them. So what, what, we are, what we are suggesting is that if you thought more about the issue and about the way that it's been constructed, and you've already said that there are aspects of your life which you would resist your socialization, oh, yeah. well, we, we, what we're, as vegans, asking is for society to be reflexive, which is what atheists ask yeah. society to do, but on this issue as well as yours. And I, have, I have actually considered the issue of vegetarianism rather than veganism and I decided I don't care enough about not eating meat. I eat meat uh, most meals. Um, some of you may notice I'm a little bigger than Roger. Um, I tra <laughs> I tra I'll arm wrestle if you want. <laughs> I train about eight times a day, not eight times a day, eight times a week uh, in between weight training and other training and things like that. So I'm on a very high protein diet. I'd be eating 
about 100 grams of protein every day, which is two chicken breasts at two meals, as well as getting it, you know, from other from grains and things like that. But you also get it. Um, and so one one point I actually wanted to discuss with you is um, how could someone like that, or like me who trains as much as me, it becomes very very difficult to maintain a vegetarian diet. Now there is marathon runners and things like that who have done it. Now there's, there's, lots, there's lots of vegan weightlifters and bodybuilders now, and in fact, you know, some of the best. You know, there's a lot of myths about you know you get this, that, and the other from animal sources when you have to check it out. The, the, the more the, the better sources of all of those things tend to be plant based, and so for example. Um, well, just in, in terms of just about any, anything you like. I mean, obviously, in terms of veganism, there are issues of, uh, about certain things like vitamin B12 and, and the, yeah. those kind of issues, right? Mm -hmm. But okay, like that. Okay. So you know, those are issues. But in terms of the fundamental nutritional requirements, then the, the vegan diet is adequate, and throughout all all the ages uh, of life, and um, you know, we've got. You know, diet take associations all around the world stating that. So, um, veganism is not a problem nutritionally, it's a problem socially. Uh, and we're going back to your point, there are, uh, as you said, there are lots of um, the, uh, the, you know, the kind of endurance kind of sports yeah, people they who are ve vegans, yeah, you know, growing up and down mountains and all that, they tend to be a lot of vegans, you know, the triathlons, that kind of thing. But there are quite a lot now of vegan bodybuilders, and it's quite easy to Google it. And you, you'll find them. I mean, one, one, guy, one guy I think is called Robert Creek, um, who's um, you know a big name within it. But I mean, the, the vegan bodybuilders now are winning prizes and stuff. So it's not. Like, yeah. uh, no, because it is very very difficult to get uh, the sort of the ease of access. You certainly have to consider what you're eating far more. Uh, I'd imagine to get the the required level of protein. Well, well, yeah. I mean, but on the on a general level, you could make that case. You know, I mean, I, I read labels. You might not. Yeah. No, not really. <laughs> but um, you know, I, d I tend I tend not to see that as a terrible kind of burden to to, 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 to you know because you see the thing is at the end of at the end of my day, you know I, I don't feel a sense of deprivation about being a vegan, which often from the outside might seem to be the case. Oh, you know they're giving up this, and they're, you know they're against that, and that you know. But you know there's a lot that vegans get. And there's a lot that we're for, like you know, peace and justice and this kind of stuff. But also, what we do get is a sense of well-being at the end of the day, because we know that we haven't deliberately exploited anyone. Okay, I, I, I still find it very interesting that you refer to animals as any one or things. That's something well, that usually if, would be reserved if, for. Well, if you if you if you look at um, legal categories, there there are two legal categories, and other animals actually are in an interesting position because you've got persons. And things. Yeah. Now, that's the legal construct. Now, sometimes the corporations are placed into the person's side of it. So it's it's not as a you know. So we're not equating persons with people. Okay. So you could have a legal person who is not human. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah so you you could have that. It's it, yeah. you know, it's feasible. I think and it was so, Mitt Romney who recently said something along the effect of corporations are people too. <laughs> well. I'm not going to say. <laughs> no, no, but it's just, just it. yeah, uh, yeah. So you know, in, in, so in, in those in those terms, you know, and there's a great animal rights philosopher called Tom Reagan, and he says that other animals are some bodies and not some things. In other words, he says that they're subjects of a life. What that means is that they've got a a psychological life, they've got a physical life which matters to them. What happens to them matters to them because they're aware. Now, there are lots of arguments about self-awareness at the moment, but it's quite interesting that there's a new academic discipline called cognitive ethology, which is showing, because in recent years we've started to research other animals, yeah. not as exploiters of them. We know a lot about how to exploit them and how to use them. We're now starting to look at them in terms of their abilities and capacities, and 